This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I was actually sexually abused when I was 12 and it changed my life. And then I went and saw the, um, the woman who was in charge of the makeup department for Channel 7, who I knew. And I said to her, I just had the shittest day with a dirty old man. And she said to me, oh, I thought you knew. And I said, knew what? She said, oh, his nickname's The Octopus. He does this to all makeup artists. Um, so there'd be a tissue with a powder puff on, so I'd have a box of tissues in my hand and a powder puff on the other, and I'd do this every single time, bar one, he would touch me. He'd run his both hands up my legs, he'd try and shove his hand inside the rip of my shorts. Uh, and nobody, none of the men in the studio stopped him, nobody said anything. It was all very, it must have just been entertaining, I suppose. But nobody did a damn thing. Um, but then men didn't stand up for women back then. My, uh, my actions were, Headlines around the world. Australian, my favourite headline, which I loved, was Australian television makeup artist dramatically stares down Rolf Harris in court. When I was 20, I was raped. Um, you know, uh, lots of shit happens when you're young. And I put it away and I just, I just decided that it was unwanted sex. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Susie Dent. Susie, how are you? James, good. You're looking well. Thank you. 61, you just told me. Yeah, you're looking amazing. Oh, thank you. A woman who's been through it as well. You exposed one of the biggest sex cases out there, which is Rolf Harris. It just became public. You waved your anonymity. How do you? Anonymity. Anonymity. Yeah. I never get it wrong. But you're now here. You've also released a book, 60s and New 40, which we'll touch on straight away to give it a plug. What's this about? Okay, so 60s and New 40 is the <laughs> ultimate guide to ageing. I wanted to put together um, the things that I feel uh, we need to really focus on as we're ageing, and it's not just diet and exercise. I really feel that when we get to this age, um, we need an upgrade in our communication skills. We need an upgrade in learning about our mindset. It's all about your mind. If you think you're going to be old, then you'll be old. So men in Australia, for instance, you'll say, how are you going, mate? Oh, I'm doing okay for an old bloke. And I'm like, so you're only doing okay and you're an old bloke. So your mantra every day is that you're only okay and that you're old. So if you keep saying it, you're going to only ever be okay, not exceptional, and you're going to age yourself by the by this being your thought, thought process. So how about turning it around and going, fit, young, strong and vital, thanks. So as soon as you say that, your energy levels are up here, you're vibrating at a higher level. Uh, so you're going to age, uh, disrupt the ageing process by using your mind. Um, yeah. yeah. I believe in all that. I was, I worked with Dr. Amoto's interpreter. He was a man who used to film crystals and take photos of it oh, and freeze it yes. and speak positive words to it. And it looked like, snowflakes and beautiful but if you spoke like evil and angry just certain words spoke to it it would be yellow and orange it would change colors I, I know i spoke about this years ago but the jam jar challenge two jam jars full both of rice white rice say i love you to one for 30 days and i hate you to one for 30 days the one they say i hate you for 30 days is all blue and moldy the one that says i love you is still all pure white Words are powerful. Yes, they are. They are very powerful. Because my good friend Leanne Brown as well, who's very spiritual now, 
Because if we were speaking, you see, oh, good morning. She said, look, stop saying that. Because it's morning. It's like at your morning something. Because was it, so it, it doesn't know the difference. Obviously, right. you're thinking morning, but they're saying like morning something. So okay. it was good rising, she used to say, but I don't really stick to that because I forget. But I know how words are powerful. Obviously, the main story is the Rolf Harris stuff, which we'll get into. But I always like to go back to the start of my guest. Get a bit of understanding about you, Susie. Kind of where you grew up and how it all began. Okay, so I grew up in Sydney. Um, I was raised, um, so I had a mother and a father and a brother, uh, my younger brother. Um, my mother was a narcissist, uh, so I was raised by a narcissist, um, which I didn't even know what a narcissist was until I was in my 50s. My father was um, very religious and he had his head in the Bible my whole life, so he was always searching for the perfect religion. So I grew up in a very strict morally strict family with um, two people who really had a problem with swear words and with communication, which is probably why I'm really big on communication and uh, not letting words scare you. Uh, and um, I realised being raised by a narcissist and a woman who has no empathy is a different way to other people, how other people have been raised. So from, the, from the age of – I left home at 18 – because I got tired of getting hit because she liked to hit and he liked to hit. And I, uh, one day um, I decided I would punch back. So I punched my mother back and laid her out across the kitchen floor and then two days later I'd moved out. And then my dad, who was overseas at, this, at that time, came to the place I'd managed to score to live in um, and spent only an hour with me, said it was probably for the best and then asked for the key back. And I didn't realise how powerful that was for many years and then I thought, wow, that's a, I would, I have a 21-year-old son, I would never, ever cut him off like that, you know. So I had an interesting childhood. I was a classic um, high achiever because when you have a narcissist as a parent, you're always trying to please them. So it didn't really matter how high I strove, what I won and what I achieved, I still didn't really get the attention that I craved as a child, as that we all crave. Um, and I did achieve a lot as a child. Um, I was, like, good at sports. I was good at all sorts of things. Not so much academia, but you can be one or the other at school. Sporty, you get away with a lot more, you know. Um, so I, that's who I was. Um, I, um, I came to England when I was 20 and discovered there was such a thing as a makeup artist. And when I was at high school, I was always the one that was either on the stage performing or backstage doing the hair and makeup. So I was always into hair and makeup because my mum was an Avon lady. So I was always surrounded by Avon and had these little tiny lipsticks that were really chiseled really beautifully and they smelt a certain way. So I always had this thing about makeup. So when I discovered at 20 there was such a thing as a makeup artist, um, I called my parents because I have dual nationality, you see. And I said, uh, if you can find me a school, I'll come home. If not, I'm going to stay here and study with the BBC. So at the time there was one school in the entire country of all of Australia that actually was a theatrical makeup artist school that taught men and women how to be makeup artists. Um, and my dad got me in there because I'd, I had this book full of awards. I did dancing. I had dancing awards and I did, um, I did the Duke of Edinburgh Award. So I had my bronze and my silver Duke of Edinburgh's awards. I had all these awards. And the lady who ran the school was a prima ballerina who used to dance in England. And she, um, and my dad was very charming and very handsome. Um, so that really helped. And he got me into the school because she thought that all this, this the, the dancer part showed that I had discipline. My dad just laughed and went, certainly, sure she does. So he got me into the school. Um, and then I, so I came home and I started doing that at 21. And I realized that um, I felt like I was at home because I'm a very creative person, but I didn't really know that I was when I was in high school. Uh, so I kind of felt like I was with my tribe you know, and uh, so I became a makeup artist and I've done that for 40 years and I've expanded myself within my career doing wardrobe and props and special effects and I'm a miniature artist. I, I can do all sorts of things as a creative and so that's kind of who I am. But I also, I do other things in my life as well. So I've kind of worked through my life being self-employed all the time. I, I've worked on shows like Home and Away, which is really popular here. Classic. Oh, no. Naples. Killed one, killed one of the main characters, the... Bobby, back in the day. It's like, <laughs> yeah, got the Polaroids to uh -huh. prove it, you know. Um, but I never stayed, I never worked full time. I always like to move around, um, you know. Um, back when I was a makeup artist um, in 19... 
86 when I was 23 was when I worked with Rolf Harris. So it was the very beginning of my makeup career. And it was a really big deal that, you know, he was the biggest star I had ever worked with. I was excited to work with him because I'd watched him on, you know, on black and white television when I was a little girl with the wobble board and all that. I wouldn't say I was a raging fan, but I knew exactly who he was. He was the most famous person to have come through Channel 7 Studios. So he was given like the red carpet treatment through, I call them the powers that be, the men that ran the station. So they all kind of greeted him and brought him down to meet the crew. So it was a small crew because it was just him for the day doing what we used to call promos I can't remember what it, what he was talking about um because it was a long time ago and uh because I was busy doing other things that day um but yeah it was a promo for the work that he was doing here or a show that he was doing right so when I um so he sat in my makeup chair I took him into a room it was a small room so maybe you know six foot well, small. It's a small room, enough room to wide enough to have uh, an ironing board in, and for uh, talent to put stuff in, and a big kind of chair that's like an old-fashioned barber's chair with a mirror in front of it with lights and stuff. Uh, and his brother was with him, and he was standing at the doorway, which is like here, and say Rolf was sitting here, and I was here, so my mirror was here, and I worked that way because I was working with my right hand. Um, you always have to touch someone's skin to find out what sort of skin type they are because you can't necessarily tell um, and then that ascertains what sort of product you're going to use on their skin, right? So, uh, and you always ask. The, the thing about makeup artists is where we touch you. We invade your aura, we invade your space. The cameramen do, don't do that. The only ones that do is makeup and wardrobe. And if uh, on a shoot like this, if you're the only one, you've got your own wardrobe, then you're the only person that's touching your body as far as wardrobe. So makeup artists, you have to have the right attitude about you as well. Um, you know what it's like if you're around someone um, it's in an angry mood. Uh, that can sometimes rub off on you, like you can feel people's vibe. Um, so it's important that as a makeup artist that you're pretty neutral or that you're always, always up. You know, I've worked with like, four of our prime ministers and I'm not going to, you know, before they do like talking to the nation and stuff and I'm not going to go, my dog died. You know, I'm so upset because that would be a shit thing to do to someone before they're about to, you know, they'd be bringing them down. So it's my job really. Psychology is a big part of what I do, which is why I've succeeded for 40 years in doing it because I can read people really well. Um, but back then this was the beginning-ish of my career. I was probably only, this is maybe my third year in. So he's sitting in my chair and I'm standing in front of him feeling his skin and he dropped his right arm down the arm of the chair and I was wearing these um, baggy denim shorts and um, a white Hanes T-shirt and black Doc Martens white socks because that was the, the kind of thing that you wore and there was like a, a rip um, in my shorts um, on the thigh which is much more modest than the rips that you see now but the beginning of when we used to wear rip shorts because the fashion had to start somewhere. Um, and he, um, I have good legs. You guys can't see that, but I have good legs. I've still got good legs now. I had shit hot legs back then. So the man couldn't keep his hands off my legs. So I stuck his hand down and ran his hand up my up my shorts. All right. So I'm standing there. So that was um, a surprise because I think at the time he was like 63. He was like old enough to be my grandfather. I was like 23, nearly 24. Um, and 23-year-olds back then are totally different to 23-year-olds now. You know, the, the Kids of today, they've got the internet. They can look up anything. They're so much more mature. We were innocent back then. We didn't even know what the word pedophile was. It was not part of everyday vernacular in society, you know. So I ran his hand up my shorts um, and up my leg and that was, like, interesting. And I turned around to the mirror and the first thing I thought of is, I can't believe he works for children. And it wasn't like I hadn't been touched by men before because I'd been touched a lot. That's what happened to women a lot in the 80s. I'm not special in that regard. When I was younger, I used to feel like I had a neon sign over my head that said, touch me because I got um, sexually touched uh, in every job that I had when I, since I left school. Uh, and this was, you know, it was a surprise because it never happened in this industry. I felt really safe working in film and TV. And I was dressed like a tomboy. I mean, that was how I liked to dress. It was easy. So he touched me and that was the beginning really and he was still talking to his brother. So he's chatting to his brother running his hand up my leg at the same time, right, so multitasking. <laughs> um, and then uh, so I did his makeup. I didn't say anything about it but I looked at him and I looked into his eyes. When you're standing that close to someone you can see them. 
and I can see people, you know, who they actually are. And he was just looking at me with I dare you kind of look um, and a really lascivious look in his eyes. So, you know, he was getting off on it. Um, the number one uh, rule as a makeup artist is you don't upset the talent, which is why I talk to you about, you know, working with people and having the right vibe. Um, you, if I upset you before you go on camera, then I'm doing a shit job. Uh, and you've got to you get in the right mindset to perform and to go on camera and to do everything that you have to do. You don't need someone bringing you down, you know. So I didn't say anything. Plus, women didn't say anything in the eighties. We, we nobody really listened to us anyway. Um, so it took him into the studio where there was um, all men working because it's a, it was more than anything. It was a male dominated industry more back then than it is now. Um, and uh, the director was around his age and the director, he, they were fairly friendly so they, they must have known each other or they'd obviously spoken before and they both started talking about me while I'm standing right there, I'm talking about my legs, what I look like, what my body was like um, whilst I was standing there. So that was uncomfortable because the director is kind of like my boss and these are, these are, this is my work environment. This is where I'm working. So they're both chatting about me. Then I'm standing there thinking, you guys, you really think that the Hollywood casting couch is alive and well in your minds and you're both so fucking old and you've got no chance. And I don't know why you're talking about me like this, but okay. So I'm just standing there being polite and nice as you do and as you did back then. Uh, and then that just kind of started off the tone of the day. It was like Ralph had given himself permission. The director had given him permission. It was okay to touch me and that's what he did. Uh, back then the, um, it was video cameras. So video cameras meant really bright lights and really hot lights because the, the bright lights without the heat hadn't been invented yet. The air conditioners always had to be turned off because quiet air conditioners hadn't been invented yet, which is also why we wore shorts and T-shirts because it got really hot. So you'd really sweat a lot. Um, so I would go up to him um, and um, blot, blot his face, get the sweat off his face because that's my job. Um, so there'd be a tissue with a powder puff on so I'd have a box of tissues in my hand and a powder puff on the other and I'd do this every single time bar one he would touch me he'd run his both hands up my legs he'd try and shove his hand inside the rip of my shorts and I'd just grab his wrist and go please don't do that because you make the rip a bit bigger and he'd just laugh and keep trying to shove his hand in twice um, I had this long belt a long leather belt because in the 80s we wore long belts right um, and he twice he grabbed the belt and pulled me towards him to try and crotch grind him and this is the to try to, to try and crotch grind me, right? Um, but you know, I kind of stood my ground with that one, so he didn't get to do that. But he tried, uh, and nobody, none of the men in the studio stopped him. Nobody said anything. It was all very it must have just been entertaining, I suppose. But nobody did a damn thing. Um, but then men didn't stand up for women back then. Um, I didn't have any men ever stand up for me when they watched other men groping me. Uh, but this was um, particularly uncomfortable because he did it every single time, bar one when he had a script in his hand. Was he doing this to anybody else? No. Nah. Well, he didn't have anybody else to play with because they were all men. He just had me. Uh, I don't think he – I don't have any recollection of him ever using my name or even bothering to remember it. He would always call makeup. So you usually you watch a monitor, like a TV screen, so you can see what the monitor sees and you can see whether they're sweaty or not. Um, but usually um, I would stand close because then I can visually see. It's easier. You know, I can see what's happening and what I see is going to be magnified by the camera. So I know that. You know, I know how to do my job. And each time he just kept touching me and he just didn't stop. He just wouldn't stop, uh, you know, and I would have to be polite and I was really, um, really aware that if I had said anything to him, back then he never told anybody to F off. Um, he couldn't slap their hands or anything. He was a huge star. Um, uh, women were not, we were not encouraged. Society didn't encourage us to stand up for ourselves. It was um, that, that, that mindset of boys will be boys. And so it wasn't a boy, though. He was a 63-year-old man. He should have known better. Uh, and women had to just tolerate this sort of behaviour. And like I said, I'd had this sort of thing before but not as much, not as blatant, not in front of a whole lot of people. Um, and um, I felt that I was responsible for a losing my career if I said anything, affecting anybody else in the room. He could have um, what we like to call in Australia had a dummy spit and walked off uh, and I, I could have cost the station millions of dollars. I didn't know. So I felt really... Um, 
I felt like it was my responsibility to cop this shit. Uh, so I didn't affect anybody else's jobs and I didn't affect his performance because, again, that's my job. It wasn't my job to be groped though. Uh, and then I started to get really bored with it, like really over it and it was starting to get pissed me off. And I, I'm one of these people that um, you can see the joy on my face but you can also see the anger uh, when I start getting pissed off and I can get really fucking angry. Uh, so um, I moved to the back of the studio and I thought, well, if he can't, you know, see me very much, then he might not need me as much. And I could, there was like a monitor back there but he still kept, you know, calling me. So then uh, I took myself out of the studio because I was so uncomfortable. I just didn't want to be in there anymore. I just didn't even want him to look at me. I didn't like the way he looked at me. Um, I was sick to death of him touching me. Uh, so I stood outside the studio and outside the studio doors you have, like you see in the movies, you have the red light. When they stop filming the red light goes off. Uh, there was a guy there, um, one of the guys was around my age um, and he knew that I was really pissed off and had had enough and um, he would come out when he really started sweating. He'd come out and get me, I'd come back in, I'd do my job, I'd get touched up again and then I'd literally just turn around, walk straight out and shut the door and stand outside the studio just waiting and watching for the red light. And then at the very end of the day, um, we usually take the makeup off. So makeup back then was really thick because with video you had to have you used we use what was called pancake makeup. So it was really thick makeup, which made the skin look really better because um, the lights were really harsh. They made you, they showed up, you know, they made just made you look bad. And video was uh, they'd say video used to put ten pounds on you. Uh, so you had to. We'd always, especially men, always take the makeup off, right? Um, but there was no way I was going to take his makeup off. Um, I was not going to go into that little makeup room with him again because I didn't trust that he wouldn't actually sexually assault me. Um, and opposite the studio doors was a broom cupboard um, that I could stand in. So I went in and I stood in the cupboard when it was the end when they were all coming out. So I hid so no one knew I was there. Um, and I could look, I could open the door a little bit and I could look up the hallway because the studio door was here, I was here and my makeup room was up there. And all my kit was still there as if I was coming back. And he went and stood outside my room in the corridor. Uh, for probably about five minutes waiting for me because I could have gone to the loo or something and I thought you can wait for as long as you like, mate. And so I just stayed in the cupboard. Um, and then um, the powers that be, the man that, men that run Channel 7, they're at the very end of the corridor and they start coming down to get him and he moves towards them and there's lots of back slapping and shoulder slapping and they um, escorted him out the front door to what I assume was his waiting car um, and I still stayed in the cupboard because I wanted to make sure because if I had come out of the cupboard and he'd come back, I was completely exposed. Like you could see down the whole corridor um, and I didn't want to come out. So then they all came back and they walked this way, which was back to their offices. And then I came out of my cupboard and I went back to my makeup room, packed everything up and then I went and saw the um, – the woman who was in charge of the makeup department for Channel 7, who I knew, and I said to her, I just had the shittest day with a dirty old man. And she said to me, oh, I thought you knew. And I said, knew what? She said, oh, his nickname's The Octopus. He does this to all makeup artists. And to be quite honest, I was really pissed off at her because she knew me. I was pissed off that I wasn't given a heads up. I was, I was kind of annoyed. I felt like I'd been um, kind of betrayed by another woman and that pissed me off. And at the same time in the same conversation, she, so this is the first time I've said anything to anybody about it, she said to me, oh, by the way, the powers that be upstairs, men upstairs, I have a message for you from them. They want to congratulate you on the way you've conducted yourself. And I just stood there and I thought, oh, that's right. You guys were all watching from the control room upstairs. And I had only just complained and I hadn't complained to management. I'd just spoken to the makeup girl. And, and then I realised that it wasn't only just the men in the studio, it was the six, eight, ten people sitting upstairs in the control room. They were watching what he was doing as well. That's a hard thing like for any man and on it's hard to try and justify men in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s for seeing that thing because it's never all right for any man to see that as a father who has a daughter, I understand I'm maybe too overprotected now because I've spoken to enough people to understand the way sick people can operate and abuse their power. And for any man to see that and not say anything is sad, is sad more than anything. As a woman, because I've spoken to enough survivors to understand how 
tough it is for anybody to even come forward and speak because a lot of people actually blame themselves what could those says things i had a man on earlier very tough man from london abused at seven abused at 14 they bottled it all up for 30 40 years because he was scared of people's reaction so you're obviously somebody in there somebody who's abusing their power people around you actually accepting it that's what he does it's an octopus that ain't okay that's fucked up so many levels, especially somebody abusing their power, some sick old pervert at 63, but yet, nah, it's okay because nobody's better than anybody on this planet, no matter how many views you get, no matter how much money you've got, you're, you're the same as everybody else. If you step over bounds, and if somebody, if I, if any man was to see somebody getting abused as a man, you've got to be do your duties and protect that woman and batter fuck out that person and... And listen, I, I don't have all the answers to how people get through all that and how they speak about it, but it's only a man's right to try and do the right thing. So if there's a lot of things getting exposed now over the years and because social media is a powerful tool. And for me, if you know somebody's getting abused, if you know somebody's abusing kids and you don't do anything about it, you're just as bad as them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would have I would have loved it for some for somebody, just anybody to have called him on it, but he wasn't. And the director who runs the room, he was egging him on. So I, there, there was nothing. And in the, and afterwards, you know, I thought, and I told everybody, I went home, I told my mother, I told my friends, I've told every man and his dog over the years. People have asked me, you know, as a makeup artist, who's the best person and the worst person you've ever worked with? And the best person changes because I've worked with superstars, you know, but the worst person has always been him um, because he just took the piss, you know. And uh, he um, and I never thought it was never called sexual assault. So I always thought that I'd been groped, and I'm a full on. I was absolutely groped by a dirty old man. Um, and like you say, not actually coming forward if you know that something like that's happening, and not coming forward is a wrong thing to do. So in 2013, right, um, and this happened to me in 1986, so in 2013 I see this TV show, Current Affair or something, and there's this woman who's I think she was maybe 48 and she had come forward to um, take him to court because he'd assaulted, sexually assaulted her with penetration, digital penetration when she was 14. And she was being crucified by the press. She'd got a PR agent who I think got 50 grand for her from a woman's magazine and then dropped her in the middle of the, the feeding frenzy so they could call her a liar. And I'm watching her and I'm thinking, well, I know you're not lying. And I, I, I don't like injustice. I'm one of those people that it wasn't about me. It was about her. So I came forward for her and I got, as soon as I saw the show, and my husband at the time, he was with me, I didn't even tell him I was going to do it. Um, he went, you know, he took, he chuffed off and I got onto my phone and I started Googling where I could actually tell them stuff that I knew so I could back up her story. Um, and I sent one email off and uh, that didn't work and then a week later I sent, I found the right place. I think I got onto Scotland Yard or something straight away and I used the word the octopus and what had happened to me on set, just a few things, and they came back to me straight away with a phone call, can I call you? And that was Gary Pankhurst who basically uh, led the whole operation. So I ended up having a chat to him. Uh, which was great. And then he, uh, you know, I got allocated my own police person, a guy called Tony who was awesome. They looked after me really, really well. And another guy called Ben, so I had two of them. Um, they looked after me really well. They kept me abreast of what was going on. Um, and this went on for like six months before I, I even knew whether I was going to go, go to England or whether it was going to be via Zoom or whatever, you know. And the weirdest thing was they told me I was going to have anonymity and I was cool with that. Uh, and then they turned around and said, um, actually, how would you feel if you didn't have anonymity? Because apparently at the time, um, so I was called a bad character witness, you know. Um, right. But that was what they call you in court. So I'm basically, I'm coming forward to tell you this is what my day was like with Ralph Harris. This was my experience. I was at work. I was his makeup artist. This is how I was treated and this was my day. Uh, so that calls me, that's what a bad character witness is called, your experience of being with someone um, rather than a good character witness. Uh, so I was asked to write an email to the judge of how I felt if I was relieved, my name was released to the press. They were only interested in the bad character witnesses. There was only six of us out of ten. There was only ten of us that did this. Um, 
And at the time there was another court case happening uh, for a, another show called Hey Dad, also run by Channel 7, also run by the same men that were looking after Channel 7. And it was a sitcom, it was a family sitcom and the father, the actor, has, had um, consistently abused the little girl who was playing his daughter. Now they were taking him to court and they won and he got sentenced to 10 years. So I worked on that show too. And my girlfriend worked on that show and she was hired um, to look after the second little girl who'd replaced her. And I worked on the show as well and was told, make sure he doesn't go anywhere near her, make sure he doesn't follow her to the toilets. Pedophile was never used again. Didn't know what that word was. Um, but when you think back on it, you know, and you're like, okay, this was the 80s, wow, okay, that's what we were doing. He had no idea that he was sexually abusing this little girl. Um, so this was all happening at the time. So I wrote a really succinct email to the judge and I told him exactly what I thought and that basically it was his call if he wanted to do that and if he wanted to throw me and my name to, you know, get dragged through the mud, that was his call. But that if women like me or if I didn't come forward, then it was like the women were being assaulted and abused all over again. So, you know, do your worst kind of thing. But I wrote a really succinct one. I put a lot of time into it. And then I'm watching TV, I'm at home, right, and I'm watching TV and the news comes on, it's a split screen, there's a male newsreader and I'm getting my pyjamas on, right, and I hear these words and I'm like, hang on, I said that because I did, I put a lot of time into it. And sure enough, there's my words on the right-hand side of the screen, there's this male newsreader reading the words of my email to the judge that went through the cops, word for word except the very last bit where I said Rolf Harris is guilty. I'm like, Fuck. How did they get that? How did they get, how did Channel 10 News get my email to the judge? I realised then that I was public property, that everything I was pissing myself laughing at the same time, everything I said or did was part of public record, that I then had to be careful, really careful with how I conducted myself um, because this was a massive case um, and it was, a, it was like a huge shock uh, that they got that they got it, like it's even now to, the, to this day. I actually only found out recently that that was basically part of public records straight away and I didn't know that. Uh, so that's how the press got it somehow. However, I don't think it would have been because um, the court case hadn't happened yet. So as far as I'm concerned, somebody leaked that letter. Money talks, you know, especially with the press. So, But it's still, it still was, it was a huge surprise to watch, to hear myself and see my letter. Who was that? After 30 years and someone comes forward exposing this man who's abused you, groomed you, made you feel worthless, how was that? Was that a sense of relief that you'd bottled up something for so long that, okay, this is my moment? Or did you have to think about what you were going to do? Or was it an easy decision to back this girl straight away? It was super easy. I didn't even think about it. How hard has it been in your life, though, to be having that from that day to seeing that young girl come forward? She, um, so I was actually sexually abused when I was 12 and it changed my life. Uh, and it wasn't rape and it wasn't penetration, but it changed my life. It changed the trajectory of who I was as a woman, how I felt about myself, how I felt about my body, um, my self-esteem. Um, I became very self-conscious about my body and what I looked like. From the age of probably 19, um, I started to cover up. I started wearing baggy clothes. I never wore anything tight. I never wore sleeveless stuff. Uh, I've never flashed my cleavage or anything like that because it was about my tits. Uh, you know, and at the time, so um, I was I was working as a 12-year-old uh, for this farmer, right, because um, I've always been, you know, an, an achiever and I loved it. I'd go to the markets really early in the morning and sell vegetables and stuff in the afternoons. And one of my friends who was 13, she got me the job and she worked for him because he was her neighbour. Uh, and, and in the afternoons and on Sundays we'd actually do farming, like we'd, you know, pull veggies and stuff like that. And there was a tent there and um, I got sent into the tent and the old man was there. And uh, he um, basically, he didn't say anything to me and he stuck his hand to my little elastic bra of my 12-year-old bra and felt my tits and my nipples and then paid me more. And coming from a really religious family, uh, I literally got out of the tent, 
and I left. I never went back and I waited out the front for my dad to come get me. I never said anything to my dad. I never said anything to my mum because I knew from the age of 11 that my mother didn't have my back. So I never told a soul. Um, it, I hated my tits when I was growing up. I come from um, a family of big-breasted women and the older I got, the bigger my breasts got, the more I hated them. The more I strapped them down, I'd wear like two things. Like a, uh, Other women will understand this when you've got big boobs. I was sporty. They get in the way. Uh, so I'd strap them down with a bra and a crop top and really just squish them um, into my body as far as I could get them so they didn't stand out. And then I'd wear baggy clothes so you could not see the shape of my body at all um, and I covered up completely because I felt like I went through life so far. Um, the bigger my boobs got, the more I hated them. So when I did start having sex when I was like 18, I would only ever have sex with a T-shirt on. Uh, because I didn't like, and I like sex, but I only have sex with a T-shirt on because I really hated that part of my body. I had great tits, <laughs> but I didn't like them um, because they'd been touched. And uh, when I was 12, being I was a Sunday school girl, um, so that became I became a prostitute in my head. And because I couldn't tell anybody about it, I had a lot of baggage about that. Um, so when I came forward for this 14-year-old girl, uh, in 2013 in the Rolf Harris case, my 12-year-old girl was going, nah, we're going to talk about this. You're coming forward. So I, it was huge, you know. Oh, emotion. It was um, – and then when I, when I did come forward, I had to – I had to – I had to say I was sexually assaulted and I'd never actually – I'd never actually – thought of myself as being sexually assaulted. When I was 20 I was raped, um, you know, uh, lots of shit happens when you're young. And I put it away and I just I just decided that it was unwanted sex. I made up excuses. I never, you know, I just dealt with it the way I dealt with it and the way a lot of women and men deal with stuff. We put it away. We lock it into that dusty suitcase in our minds and slam it shut, you know. So when I came forward for the Rolf Harris case and the police are saying you were sexually assaulted, you were sexually assaulted, all the stuff that happened to me from when I was 12 came back. So it was much heavier than I had anticipated. My dad died six months before. My husband was going through, uh, he was really angry. He was going through depression and had huge anger management problems at the time. So he was supportive and not supportive. So I was kind of really alone. Um, I was really lucky I got to uh, take a girlfriend with me. The cops paid for me, the British police, and I believe because Rolf Harris lost, he paid for me to come over um, and help put him in jail. Um, but it was heavy. Yeah, so you're not just doing it for the young girl who came forward through Rolf Harris, you're also doing it for the young girl who you were. And is that when it brought everything to the surface from 12, 20, yeah. 23 and trying to shed light? Because the most important thing is speaking about it and it's the hardest fucking thing though. So see when you decided to go forward, were you ever in your mind that nobody would believe you? Oh, totally. I didn't think anybody believed me at all. I thought that because he had a position of power and because he was really famous and he painted the Queen and, you know, rich, famous, powerful men get away with shit all the time. So, you know, I came forward but I didn't actually believe that they would manage to actually get him into, into court but I was coming forward anyway and I literally came forward for the woman that I saw on screen and then I found out from the British police that there were dozens of women that came forward, dozens from all over the world, some of whom were like really young girls when he assaulted them. And then so when I first met him and he first touched me and I turned around to that mirror and was shocked that he worked with children, I was right because I saw him and I saw inside him when I looked into his eyes, you know. So I... Um, I was even more grateful that I was, that I'm this strong woman that came forward to support these other women who are little girls. And I think when we do come forward for other people uh, in life and we don't just do things for ourselves, we're so much more powerful when we're doing things for others. And I got, I got so much healing out of it that I had no idea I would get when I came forward after the court case and that he was actually found guilty. Um, you know, I stood up in court 
I'm talking about, I started talking about my knickers because back then, because he kept shoving his hand up my shorts uh, and back then was the beginning of the G-string, you know. So he had two triangles, a triangle at the front, triangle back, and a piece of elastic that would pretty much go around your waist. So he would keep trying to push his hand further and further up my leg because he couldn't feel my knickers. Um, and I talked to the court about this and I made the jury laugh because I'm a funny chick, you know. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm in court and, I'm, and I was told not to look at him by my cop. The funny thing was I was actually smuggled into court because, like, there was, like, press everywhere. It's the biggest court case in the world. Um, and right next to the doors is a broom cupboard. So the irony did not escape me that I'm waiting to go into court standing in a fucking cupboard again with a cop and my girlfriend, you know. Uh, and he told me not to look at him at all. He said, just look at uh, the lawyers, uh, you know, the barrister's lawyers, the judge and the jury. He said, don't look at him. And I'd been in the courtroom in lunchtime. I'd been taken in there by the um, the court guy, which was great, and it was empty. So I got to see the huge perspex cage, like it was like a cage that he was in with a big trestle table and there was paperwork and shit on it and this chair that he was sitting on. And, where, and he told me where everybody was going to be sitting um, and where all the there's microphones everywhere. They're all over the floors. They're everywhere. And I got to stand in in the witness box and you know ask me, you know, what if I want to swear on the Bible and all that. Uh, and then when I did go in there, it was packed, like wall to wall people, absolutely packed. Um, and I did what I was told because um, you know, I did say to the guy, I said to my copy, sure, I can't walk up past him and do that. He's going, no, Susie, don't. And I think he kind of thought I might have done it. But when I was finished, um, at the end of my testimony, his lawyer or barrister called me, it was a woman, she called me a liar. I put it to you that you're lying. And um, I'm so gobsmackingly honest uh, that was like a real insult and I understand that was her job and I also understand that that's what she did to everybody. Um, I did find out later that there was a New Zealand woman um, who was like live via satellite who lost her chops when she was called a liar and abused the crap out of her and I thought, oh, well, there you go, you got that. Me, I'm standing there and um, I snorted with derision and I couldn't snort. Now, if you paid me, like seriously, it surprised the shit out of me that I actually snorted after being called a liar because it's really, um, it's a lot of responsibility, you know, standing in court, telling your truth in front of the world um, and you, you, I didn't, I had no preconceived ideas of what sentence he should have because that's not my job. My job was to tell the truth about my day and that's what I did. The fact that I made the jury laugh is just because that's who I am as a person. And then, then you called a liar, and then it was then literally that was my turn to get off the stand. So when I did get off the stand, the only person I looked at was him, because I'd been really good up to then. And then I looked at him, and I looked at him as I walked down the aisle, and I glared at him the entire time. I looked at nobody else. I stared. I mean, it's called a stare down. I didn't know. I had to look it up later. I glared at him all the way out, um, and he turned his entire body around. He did not make eye contact with me once. Is that Carol? Ha, yeah. All the press were behind him. My girlfriend was watching all of this happen. They were going mental writing in their little books, right? I was just completely focused on, you know, glaring at him and watching him turn away from me. And I kept walking and I grabbed my bag and I said to my girlfriend, let's go. Now the court doors, they're quite thick, right? So I've got a bit of a pace going because at the time the emotions were starting to come out. I was halfway between being really fucked off and really upset. So it was all just, it was coming out of me and I needed to get out of there, you know, to keep my cool. Um, and I shoved the door thinking that it was really heavy, not heavy. So I walk, and there's two doors and I've got a pace on and I shove this door and it hits the wall, bang, bang, and the whole courtroom's like jumps twice. Like, Susie Dent has left the building, you know. <laughs> so I made quite an impact when I left and then as soon as I got out of there, one of the cops came running after me so I wouldn't go the wrong way because by then I started to get upset. And then I find myself in this little room surrounded by police going, I fucking didn't lie, I'm fu that's fucked, I'm fucked, I'm fucking this, I'm fucking that. And someone bought me a cup of tea so I could chill the fuck out um and then Gary Pankhurst came and he stood in front of me and he took my hand and he said to me well done he said you did really good Susie we're really proud of you and I'm just like oh fuck okay how <laughs> many people actually came forward to expose him there was 10 of us 
Um, there was four women who actually um, were the little girls that he sexually assaulted and there were six bad character witnesses who'd also one man who had worked with him um, uh, as uh, he was presenting on a show in Australia. He was presenting on a show and this guy like was the audience warm-up guy or something like that uh, and the other women had all been assaulted by him in some way, shape or form. Who was it seeing Rolf Harris in the courtroom that day for the first time after so many years? Um, well, I'd never bothered to look at him. Whenever he came on the screen, I just, you know, I turned it off. Uh, I never followed his career. I didn't give a shit. Um, but when I did actually look at him and he was there, I couldn't help myself but glare at him uh, like I couldn't help myself. I, it's just I can't tell you what I was thinking except that I was full of emotion, anger and upsetness of being called a liar. Uh, and my uh, my actions were headlines around the world. Australian, my favourite headline, which I loved, was Australian television makeup artist dramatically stares down Rolf Harris in court. That's why I had to look up stare down. I thought, yeah, she, that was me. And that I wasn't supposed to tell many people, but my friends in Australia who knew what I was doing were following, obviously, and they're like, yeah, girl, Susie. So, um, but I was really pleased that I had such strong headlines um, for the other women who hadn't come forward, for all the dozens of women that weren't chosen to be part, to be part of the case by the judge, for the women that were part of the case. One woman had to stand behind a blanket. Uh, she couldn't eyeball him at all. So I was glad. I knew they'd see these headlines and I hope that um, that my strength of character would give them the strength to keep going because even then we didn't know whether we were going to win or whether it was just going to be whatever or a complete waste of time. But we all knew that he was um, not a good person because we'd all had our own physical moments with him. Um, but we did win. So how would how did the press treat him? The media would anybody support him? Was anybody trying? To... It was interesting um, because back then we still lived in what what was called the society of disbelief. So there was millions of people around the world that were getting their Susie hate on. Uh, you know, we're all liars. I was a liar. You know, even his brother came out and called me a liar. You know, front page headlines and I'm a liar. And I thought, fuck off. Um, and I thought, and I thought, yeah, well, I put you in my testimony, mate, and that you didn't see it, so I actually had your back, so maybe you should have read it first. Um, and he's saying things like, oh, if I had seen that happen, you know, I would have stopped him. It's like, well, you didn't and you were there and nobody did. Um, so it was um, a lot of, there was a lot of hatred, a lot of disbelief uh, because Rolf Harris was a national treasure of England, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, many, many countries. Um, he, I actually, in one of the documentaries I'm in uh, that I watched, it was like he was named one of the top five entertainers of like, our generation, that's like massive, you know. And I only realised recently oh, I was a bit bigger than I thought he was. Um, so there was people, uh, they were full of disbelief uh, and uh, I, I had only come forward for the money of which I had not been offered any, nor would I have taken it. I only came forward, um, I'm lying, we're all lying because there's no way Rolf Harris would have done that. Uh, and the reason is that people believe what they saw on TV and they'd watched him from when they were young and they'd let their children watch him from when they were young and they'd invited him into their homes with I this trust. I used to watch the prank. Of course. We all did. We all did. You know, that's why it's called hiding in plain sight, you know. And he worked with children all the time. So as, an, as, as, a, as a society, not just in this country but in several countries, society was in shock that they'd been duped by this man uh, you know, and they felt guilt and shame that they'd that they'd liked him and that they'd loved him and that they wanted to be on his show when they were kids. There was so it was it wasn't just about um, us coming forward. Us coming forward changed the world, and 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 uh, exposing Ralph Harris really changed the world and the society that we lived in for the better. So naivety was stolen uh, and that's a good thing or taken away. I think people became a lot less naive about what they watched on television. Uh, it's mad though that all those sick individuals, now I don't want to upset anybody, but anybody who works with kids, especially male, I've got to question them now because I've interviewed so many people and you never think because Jimmy Savile you look at and you just think, 
sex case wrong and you, you yeah I do anyway and you, you, but nowadays people like they can hide they can portray it and I've interviewed the undercover paedophile who went deep undercover for 20 years they don't just groom kids paedophiles are not there to groom the kids they'll groom the parents first the parents think they're a good guy the parents will let them push the boundaries with the kids and and that's the sad thing it's your kids do not let them go with anybody else don't let them stay over with anybody else cub scouts football and it's hard because you want your kids to live their life, but there's so much fucking badness on in this world and so many kids take their own life because they've been abused as kids and are too scared to come forward because of what people will judge them. And like Jimmy Savo and Ralph, uh, Rolf Harris and who else we got? Gary Glitter. Gary Glitter. Loved Gary Glitter, the Gary music Glitter. when I was younger. Like there's some heavy names and they all worked with the same company and then, and it's not necessarily because like, people slate the BBC, and I get it. They're covering up for paedophiles. They're actually, it's not meaning they're all sex cases that work in these big corporations. But what happens is if these people get exposed and they're their main guy who's working on the mainstream, what happens is they lose sponsors, they lose credibility. So they'll do as much as they can to cover it up and discredit yourself and discredit survivors and discredit everybody else to come forward. Listen, you'll lose your kids, you'll lose your job. So people are too scared. And we've got a lot of shit with Philip Schofield. I know you don't really want to touch in because you don't know the information. But again, a man who worked with kids, a man who, listen, if he's had sex with somebody who's over 16, then that's nobody else's business. But it's the lies to his wife for over 20 years. It's the known his brother was a paedophile and covering it up. Like, there's so much more to these things. And you see people coming out and giving statements, leave him alone, it's mental health. But if it is the case that he's grooming kids from a young age, then he's a fucking wrong and nobody should be caring about his mental health. Fuck him. Oh, and totally. That, and that goes for like Rolf Harris's. But did you see the power that they had, the protection that or then people were trying to sweep it under the carpet? Did you see this with your own eyes? You've seen it straight away when it was happening. Oh, people yeah. turning a blind eye, but did you see it even more once you started to realise how dark the world can be? Um, it's funny. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned the BBC. Because uh, I was actually discovered the day after I went to court by the BBC by this female producer uh, and she hounded me to be on a show with the BBC. Because I've worked in television for such a long time, she contacted me via email and I thought, oh, this will be fun. I want to see how far you go with this because I've seen other people people who don't know how TV works and they don't know how abusive the press can be and how manipulative and they get sucked into it and they like, like the girl I saw on A Current Affair. And I thought, I want to see how far they go. Um, so she took me on a fun little ride of um, they wanted to do a full-on TV show with me. My name, they give you a fake name. Um, SD was my initials. Oh, geez, that's really creative, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so, you know, she found me. She would have found my CV. Um, so she um, the, she got as far as um, wanting to do a show with me, blank out my face, uh, get someone else to have an accent. And then one day she actually called me, lied through her back teeth and told me that my name had been released in court. And that really spun me out because uh, my kid was 12 at the time. Um, my husband was, you know, having mental health issues. Uh, I... I I had the um, federal police, the Britain, the from Brisbane in Queensland. I had the feds number uh, to two mobile numbers, so I could call them if the press actually turned up on my doorstep. So my kid and my husband wouldn't be freaked out. And for a whole weekend, I couldn't get onto the cop that uh, had been allocated to me because he was on a long weekend with his family. So for a whole weekend, I'm like scouring. Um, I'm on the internet looking for where my name's been actually released. And then I, f I got on to, I uh, spoke to my husband. He said, she's lying, she's lying. And she was lying. Um, but that was really wrong of her. And that was the BBC. It's interesting, isn't it, how mm. far they'll go. I, um, I, I was quite a, uh, I wasn't really aware of um, other pedophiles and things that went on. I think, um, and having worked in television, you know, and for like Home and Away, I was very aware from a very young age how manipulative the press can be. Um, you know, so the kids that, and they were kids working on Home and Away, if they were standing together on a step, No Idea, which is a magazine called New Idea, we'd call it No Idea, they would print that they were actually lovers and we would just piss ourselves every Monday morning, you know, piss ourselves laughing, going, okay, who have you been doing this weekend? You know, because they would just put whatever photos they wanted and say whatever they wanted. I don't think, um, I think the laws may be a little bit better now, but maybe not. So I'm very aware that a lot of the stuff that we read is not true. 
Yeah, because the media kill people with the things they say. I think they've loosened that a little bit. They need to be more careful. But back in the day, Paul Gascoigne, famous footballer, had him on the podcast. He, he turned to alcohol, one of the greatest footballers of all time. Like, at his peak, it was unbelievable. And turned to the drink. But he was actually sober. He was in rehab. But what the press used to do was leave empty bottles of vodka outside his door, bang his door, fuck off round the bin. And then when they came to the door, he used to pick them up and he used to take photos. Paul Gascoigne back in alcohol. He lose sponsorship deals. He lose businesses because they thought it was a drinking again that so but back then you're getting 50 grand 100 grand for a, a front page story and yeah. then these people go and kill themselves don't they yeah they kill people you know we've we've um i've yeah. i've um you know people that i've worked with in the past have been completely bullied and they've been bullied to death by press by by people thinking the wrong things and i never read any negative press about me um uh, did you like, worry about that though no nah. But you seem like a tough fucker anyway. Um, I'm a tough fucker. You know right? what I mean? Because obviously probably the shit you've went through as a kid with your mum and other stuff that's yeah, happened. it does. It gives you thick skin. Yeah, you kind of realise. And you, you kind of stand by yourself in the world. You, you know, I, was, I certainly wasn't used to running, and, oh. running home to mummy and daddy. I was used to standing on my own, you know, and that was a good thing. Um, but, yeah, no, I didn't read it. If you don't read it, you don't see it, you know. How long did the court case last? It was months. It went on for months. It felt like it felt like ages. Was that a lot of pressure on your life? No, I stayed here for a month because Australia's a long way away, um, and went. Um, you know, had little adventures with my girlfriend and wandered around London and went to France for four days. Um, but even and uh, the whole time, uh, oh yeah. So when the BBC woman found me, a week later I was contacted every single day, several times a day by about thirty different press from around the world, radio, newspapers, television shows, Channel Seven in Sydney. In 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 Sydney, I'm just like seriously. Oh, you think I'm going to talk to you? Um, it was interesting. Um, that got a little bit stressful. I got I would answer the phone with is this call being recorded. Uh, so I got really quite cluey, but you have to be on your toes all the time because you never know who's going to ring you, whether they're going to find you, if they find your phone, you know. So I was really, I was really, really glad that I had my friend with me. And the police said that, you know, you'll need a support person and they were right because if I had been on my own, I would have, you know, probably gone to different places in my head. Um, they really spun out. Um so that was, you know, it was interesting and I didn't, um, I'd said all along to all of them, um, I'm not giving my story. I don't wish to be the poster girl for groping. I'm not going to give you a story. The answer is no. And I knew exactly what would happen to me. They have photographs of me when I was 23, what my legs look like, what I look like back then. And I know what people do. They look at me then and go, it was she fuckable then? And they look at you now and I was, what, 50, 51 at the time, is she fuckable now? Would I fuck? you know is she is she doable um so consequently do i believe that rolf harris might have touched her up and that's how people in society look at you and other women came forward after the court case after we won um there was like two women one lady um was on one of your morning shows you guys had a run of having morning shows from a bed um and she was on a breakfast on a bed show and she'd interviewed Rolf Harris and she came forward to the press and she was a larger lady and she was completely vilified um, and ripped to shreds because it was like, well, I wouldn't do you, so I don't believe he would have touched you. And I knew that's what would happen. Um, I knew uh, it wouldn't necessarily happen to me like that, but I knew that that's what the mindset would have been. That was unpleasant to know that that was going to happen. That's why, I mean, I had no intention of coming forward anyway. Uh, and uh, even, even at the very end, the police came forward to me and they said, are you sure you don't want to speak to our publicity department and come forward? I'm like, no, because this is not about me. This is about the women who were little girls who had their lives changed. My life, I wouldn't say my life changed. It didn't affect my sex life. I became very mouthy though and I would say fuck off to any man that came near me that I didn't want to come near me. He was the last man that ever touched me without me wanting to. And I did really, uh, I suppose it did change me. I didn't wear a dress. I wasn't wearing a dress then. Um, I stopped wearing dresses for 30 years. I just completely wore baggy clothes the whole time. I really did feel like I moved through life much safer like that. I couldn't change my face and I'm glad about that. I'm grateful that I look nice and I'm grateful that I look nice now. 
And then I completely changed my life at the age of 55. You're going to like this. Um, uh, I put it out to the universe that I wanted to be in front of the camera for a change. I used to sing in rock band, so I'm a singer. Um, so I'm quite happy with the microphone. And I got this message, you've got to be careful what you wish for with the universe. And this woman contacted me. She'd seen my photo and she said, we think you'd be a really good contender for the Mrs Earth Australia Beauty Quest. Pissed myself laughing and fell off the bed, you know. And I got back in touch with her and I said, thank you, darling, you've like made my month. But I'm like, I'm nearly 55. I don't wear high heel shoes and I don't wear dresses. Uh, and she said, no, no, women, women your age are doing this. And I checked them out and they supported a charity which collected new and new shoes for people around the world. And I thought, I realised that I was having my own sliding doors moment. Life was very unhappy with my husband back then. Like I was, you know, like really unhappy. It was not good. Um, and I really wanted to change my life. Uh, I really wasn't happy with where I was going. And I, as a makeup artist, I've made women look beautiful my entire life and watched them wear beautiful gowns that I felt really I couldn't actually wear. And I thought, I don't want to be 70 and never experience what it's like to actually wear a gown and look really beautiful and feel okay. So I said yes to the most out there left field thing about being a beauty queen, which was so outside my comfort zone. But I pushed through all this stuff and I started wearing dresses and talking about shoes and going and speaking as a motivational speaker and talking about shoes. And I collected tons of shoes and raised heaps of awareness. And I like to say I built, I built my self-esteem one frock at a time uh, and then I got a gown made for me. I enter, uh, Anyway, I went down to a one. So I won the first Mrs. Earth Australia. I beat women who I could have given birth to, which was super <laughs> cool, you know. Uh, I found myself three months later in Vegas representing Australia with 36 other women from around the world, um, some of whom I'm, I swear must have been born with, you know, high heel shoes on. Um, I had to learn how to walk in six-inch, I call them hooker heels, nothing against hookers, six-inch heels, right, which sort of makes me six foot a long way down you know, I didn't want to face plant the stage. So for like two weeks I'd stand on my carpet in my, at the end of my bed just stand, trying to get my balance and then I'd, you know, I look like a, a thunderbird when I walked in there because I'm used to wearing runners and orthotics don't fit in, you know, in high heel shoes. Uh, so I taught myself how to wear shoes. I threw myself into the pageant industry. I studied the pageant industry in, in America. Um, I got my posture back on. Um, I got my girl back on uh, and I came third in the world and came home to stacks of press, the, the 55-year-old Tom Boyd, a beauty queen, um, ended up inspiring women uh, to change their lives. I built my self-esteem to the high levels that my confidence was already at. Um, it was quite amazing. When I was actually here in 2014, I'd had this huge kind of healing inside the walls of Stonehenge, which is where I feel all my relatives were with me, all my ancient, all these spirits were with me in 2014. I had this like healing and I cried bucket loads of tears and I looked like uh, I, I looked younger after that. I'd like offloaded all this stuff from going to court when I was saying earlier that I'd had this healing and I, it was so unexpected. You know, I grieved my dad. I got rid of the anger I felt to my mother. I learned about I, I forgave myself because uh, forgiveness is the gift we give ourselves, not others. I forgave every man that ever assaulted me. I just let it all go and then I started to heal and then I became a beauty queen. And, and became a motivational speaker and blew my mind, you know. And now I'm quite comfortable wearing dresses. Um, and I've been, and I've spoken all around the world now about healing and forgiveness. And now I find myself here again. Uh, and I'm staying now. I came for three weeks and decided to stay for six months because I feel that um, this is where I belong. And I feel a lot of ties here because I'm a first generation Australian. Um, and I've had a lot of press lately, which is great. And I've been able to, since he died, Rolfie, people have asked me how I felt. Um, and I've managed to control the narrative a little bit um, and talk about his wife and his daughter um, and, and the fact that we have to think about them just like Philip Schofield. We have to think about his daughters and his wife and the people that are attached to them and whether they knew that dad was gay or that hubby was gay or whether they didn't. And we tend to forget about the people that are related to these people that turn into monsters in society. We have to be really mindful, I feel, of others around us. So I've been able to make my story about healing and forgiveness and 
I'm kind of really grateful in a way. I feel like life chose me in 1986 to have a bad day with a dirty old man so I could be this strong, buffy chick in court uh, and use my voice uh, and come out and, and help take a bad man down, change society, do all this stuff I had no idea I was doing when I came forward. Um, and I've had many, many women and men reach out to me over the years um, to not – just say thank you but to share their stories of assault and that is a humbling thing for someone to trust you enough to share their journey with you uh, because the only way we heal is when we speak and when people speak for the first time of being sexually assaulted that's the beginning of their healing journey and that's what these sort of things are all about this is why we have to keep speaking this is why what you're doing in your podcast and you're talking to people who are speaking to you about being sexual assaulted sexually assaulted that's why it's so important because you're helping people heal and you're help getting emotional again you're helping people on their healing journey and that's a really big deal like you're telling stories and some of the stories and the interviews that you have like my story is sensational and it was really huge and other people's stories are huge but the more they speak the more they start to heal and that's so important because life is so fucking short when you get yeah. when you get there so and that's the thing about life i always say this but talking about it as the healing process you must face it to heal it you must face it to own it and no matter if it's good or bad you've got to face it if you run away from it it's still going to be there and it's always going to get worse and worse and worse a friend of mine calls it the parasite you must face that, talk about that, kill the parasite, yeah. kill that fucking negative vibe, that internal pain that you've got. And the only reason, you, way you can do that is by facing it, talking to it, healing it and owning it. And that's the sad thing because a lot of people don't know how to handle trauma and pain. And we've all come through trauma in my life. Everybody's got different levels of trauma. See, when you're going through the court case and all those innocent girls, innocent women, even innocent men, See, when he got his verdict, did you know the outcome or did you have to wait till you seen it on the news? I uh, know. I was actually, the first person that called me was the BBC reporter. It was about, I was at home in Australia. It was about midnight. I knew it was happening that day. So I was kind of like awake-ish. Uh, and then the cops called me a little bit after her. But she called me so she could get a statement, the statement that she'd been hounding me for, for ages. So I, pretty much my statement was congratulations to the police for a job well done. And what was going through your mind once you got a guilty? Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and is that when you felt, did you feel a relief or was it that moment totally. of stone? No, I felt absolute relief. I felt so proud of the women who came forward that were little girls. I felt so proud of all of us that we took on, um, not just him, but we took on uh, we took on the world in a way, um, that we'd pushed through it, um, that we'd all been brave uh, and that we'd had a really good outcome. Um, you know, and because some some of the women who are part of the case, they have not waived their anonymity. I did that in 2019. What made you do that? Um, the Me Too movement happened in 2017, what I like to call the biggest healing movement for women that the world has ever seen, where many victims of sexual assault actually put the hashtag Me Too on their social profile, which for many, many women was the first time they ever admitted that they'd been sexually assaulted. Some of them, and women that I know, um, put it on and then felt shame and pulled it off. Uh, you know, because there's a lot of people that need a lot of healing, but four out of five women and I think two out of five men are sexually assaulted in their lifetime. So it's a big deal for many of us. So in 2019, England going ahead in leaps and bounds with changes in, in, um, in business and in society, the USA, New Zealand, all doing really well. Unfortunately, Australia, which is still a misogynistic country really, had not and uh, we had other court cases happening uh, again in the entertainment industry uh, that I like to call the circus because there's no H and R department in my industry. There is in other industries. So if something happens to you, there isn't really anyone that you can go to and complain to. There isn't big unions that'll back you or anything like that. Uh, so there were men coming forward and people coming forward saying they'd been assaulted and money was winning, and it pissed me off a bit. So I came forward because I was ready. Uh, I'd gone through my Mrs. Earth thing. My self-esteem and my self-confidence were really high. Uh, 
Uh, so I, you know, I found my true authentic self. I had my voice. I'd found my voice and um, I wanted to use it and I wanted to try and change the defamation laws in my country. But what I really wanted to do was um, give Australia a wake-up that this all started with us um, in 2013 with Hey Dad and with the Rolf Harris in 2014, uh, that I wanted to remind Australia that there was Australians that had come forward to change the world and that we needed to keep going and we needed to keep talking about things and to keep the conversation going. Because with anything, as long as we keep the conversation going, that's when change is going to happen. And we're dealing with a generational mindset from, you know, Rolf Harris was, what, 93 and when he died and, and the men that were taken down by Operation Nutri were older, the older generation, my parents and older generation. Um, and we're, they're finally dying off, you know. But they have still passed this mindset on to their kids um, and their sons and their daughters to believe that, oh, well, you just have to cop this sort of behaviour. So we're breeding it out. It's being a aged away um, and these things don't happen quickly you know uh, you can't really if you can't like I don't think you can if you're in a conversation with someone and they say the wrong thing and you bite their head off you're not helping them stop it has to be handled in a in a in a mature way coming from a place of kindness you don't um uh, what's the way to put it um you don't really affect someone's dignity when you're talking to them. You don't ridicule them that, hey, you're saying the wrong thing, mate, you know, get get with it, this is 2023. That's not going to help anything. Having a discussion like we're doing and continuing this conversation about how men should act, how women should act um, and how society is now and we don't play touchy-feelies anymore is how we make change. Yelling and screaming about it doesn't work. Having proper conversations does, you know, mm-hmm. and talking about it on a corporate level. Um, I know there's a lot of confusion around how people should behave and there was a lot of confusion with the Me Too movement, which was again changed uh, by, no offence, by men to make it into something that it wasn't when really it was women standing up for themselves and being heard. The thing with the Rolf Harris court case, it was... um, the first time in history that uh, and the, those cases with Operation Nutri that women from historical sexual crimes had been listened to and heard and action had been taken. That's what changed society, that we'd actually been heard and believed. How do men get educated? Because we're living in a society where some people are just uneducated on boundaries and that's a sad thing because people can push and push and push where... They've crossed the mark. So how do young kids, young boys, because porn is a massive thing in this planet where I think 60 or 70% of stuff that's watched online is porn and it's all free and it's fucking with young kids' minds, male and female, but porn is a depressant. It grains the amygdala in the brain. It makes you depressed. And I think people can see women as objects instead of actually seeing the beauty and seeing the finer things. As I've got older and the people I speak to, I start understanding life and understanding people and different roles and how people should be playing that men they build the world women create it with giving life the most important thing on the planet that both roles are just as equally as important as each other but how do men be more educated what do you think needs to be put in place for kids and men to understand that fucking hell that it's changed days where things back then may have been more accepted than it is now with porn, just in in general, if you well, be, in general, yeah. with porn, men have to men um, have to w- women know that porn is fake. Mm-hmm. Women know that they don't actually like having sex the way that it's portrayed like that. You know, um, women know that they like to have they like to be with a man and make love. They don't like to be fucked the way that porn portrays. Porn portrays um, women as as objects, like you said, um, and it portrays a way of having sex that's really not. Uh, acceptable. So men need to be educated and boys need to be educated if they're into porn. Uh, I have no problem with porn. Porn is great to masturbate to, but like you said, it changes. Um, it changes your brain chemistry and it changes who you are. And then when you, when young men do get with a woman and they think that that's how they're supposed to have sex and they're in for a rude surprise when the girl's just like, you're not fucking doing that to me. <laughs> you know, he could, no, I'm not going to touch you. And then, and then he's weird, but he doesn't know why. Because he's been educated and brought up on porn, I think um, we need to really educate. And it starts at school in Australia now. In school, they're talking about consent. They're teaching kids about consent and teaching about boundaries. You know, um, my child is twenty one, and um, when he was at school, basically um, his his friends, you know, basically for them um, giving head 
to a guy wasn't actually sex. And, and I'm just like, yeah, but is he giving you head? Is it reciprocal? No. I was like, well, you're not really having sex then. Uh, he's, he's getting more than you are. Um, but they were like, well, it's not sex. So they have to be educated. Boys and girls need to be educated. Sex is sex. Intimacy is intimacy. I'm not saying they have to be virgins until they're married because that was the whole other uh, thing of, you know, uh, really screwing with people. We have to understand how to communicate um, and sex is a big thing with men and women uh, and uh, there's sex and there's making love and they're two different things and porn is just it's a thing that's used uh, and we need to be just like the actors on TV, just like watching Rolf Harris not be the person that he really is. We have to understand uh, that it's not how sex really is uh, and it's not really that's not going to be the way that's going to be enjoyable. There's a lot more female porn out there now. There's a lot more female directors now actually, uh, you know, creating porn that's more um, feminine friendly uh, because basically the porn industry was run by men for a while and it was um, violent really towards women and aggressive, a lot of aggressive sex. So now we find there's a lot more porn out there that's more female friendly. Even 78% of porn though is abuse. Oh, it's all abuse, really. So you're watching you know? abuse happening. Yeah, you are. are female, so yeah. that's the thing with the mind. It's, you're absorbing that. It's going to eventually fuck you up. So maybe we make porn harder to actually get in touch with. Maybe we should we get be, it. why is it free? Because I know that the damage it does in a human brain. Well, then why is it free? Exactly, it's big corporations, so, isn't it? They and, want, and they so somebody's, but somebody has to be making money somewhere, don't they? Yeah. Because if it's free to the public, they have, somebody has to have paid for it. Someone has to pay for the production. Someone has to pay the actors. Someone's paying for it somewhere and someone's making money out of it somewhere. So there you go. So we stop advertising on porn. So the big the big businesses are the ones that have to be stopped. Uh, and Too much money though. That's where you go. The money's the world's drained. So yeah. and that's it. So there's so it's all and it's always about money. This yeah. is why Rolf Harris wouldn't be stopped because it was about advertising revenue. It was all about money and it's all about money. But what price to society? Like you've said, for the few that make money to the many that get harmed. It's mad to show how this mainstream media can spin the narrative though and portray these people as good, innocent, family man. Just did he have kids, Rolf Harris? They have what? Did they have kids? Who? Rolf. Oh, yeah, he had a daughter. So he had the daughter. He had a daughter, Bindi. Yeah. And she would have been very affected like this, like his oh. wife would have been, you know. And the thing is, is the, the big kicker with Rolf Harris is that he was, he was um, sexually abusing her best friend in their home from when she and groomed her from when she was a little girl. Uh, and the documentary that I'm in at the moment, uh, Rolf Harris Hiding in Plain Sight on ITVX. <laughs> uh, she's actually come forward through her psychiatrist. She still hasn't waived her anonymity, but he talks about what her journey was like with him and how she felt. And she might never come forward and that's fine because that's fine. How many victims do you actually think he's... He had dozens through all over the years, world. Maybe hundreds, huh? Could, Yeah. Yeah, I know dozens and dozens came forward. There was a second court case and dozens more came forward. And I'm still, I st look, uh, the other day I was in a television studio and the makeup artist, um, uh, she actually came out to me and told me she was assaulted by him and she was working with him as well. But you don't say anything because they're stars um, and you're kind of like you don't think of it, women of a certain age don't, are not educated in a way to think of a certain type of groping to be sexual assault. We're being groped. If someone sticks their hand around you and grabs your boob, you're being groped. But now we know it's sexual assault. Now if anybody touches you and does that, you can actually, well, in Australia, it's assault. You know, you did that to me, you grabbed my boob, I'm, I'm going to take you to court, I can take you to the police. I can get you jailed for that. But in 1986, the police aren't even interested. They're not so what, sweetheart, you know. Mm. I'm not going to do anything. How did you get through it all from, from you're a kid and the abusive household, kind of dysfunctional to try and kick on and be something in your life? You've kind of went on and stood on your own feet to then be getting abused again by some fucking dirty old pervert and then you've bottled up for 30 years, you're married, you struggled with that, with the mental health. Like, what, what do, why do you think it's, what do you think it's gave you the strength to then still have a smile on your face, to still try and kick on and do stuff with your life? What do you think that was? I think it was probably my inner fortitude, my faith in myself. Um, 
my ability to be have a smile on my face. I'm kind of um, I live my life with gratitude. I'm thankful every day and I start my day being gratitude. I'm, I'm grateful for being here. I'm grateful for things. When you live a life and you've got gratitude at the beginning, middle and end of it, uh, you can. it gives you the ability to deal with things. If you wallow in things and you let um, your mind go to places that they shouldn't, uh, then that's when it can really hurt you. A lot of people need counselling, you know, uh, or coaching. There, was, there wasn't anybody like that when I was a little girl. And I just kept it all to myself because I knew that I wouldn't be believed, but it did affect my life, you know. So basically I ended up, I hated my boobs so much that I ended up cutting them off. So I had a breast reduction when I was 29. As soon as they changed the operation so that I could have the milk ducts, so they changed it so the milk ducts would still be attached, I had a breast reduction. When I had the breast reduction, I felt great. So it was like um, I'd cut away all the old stuff, the bad stuff that was attached to me. I know that's quite – I'm not actually saying that that's what you should do is change your body, but I changed my body and changing my body was the biggest psychological trip I'd ever been on and I actually liked my kids for the first time in my life. They grew back. Um, but they're still really happy. But what I, do you mean they grow back? Oh, they actually do. When you have a breast reduction, they actually grow back. Well, then, then I had a child, so, um, <laughs> you know, they, they, they grow back a bit. But they grew back happy. But it was weird at the time when I did it, I kind of felt like I'd cut away a lot of stuff and I didn't – I wasn't – doing it for that reason I was doing it because I had really big boobs and I, and they hurt your neck and they hurt your shoulders um, and so I had a breast reduction and they were small and nice and I really liked them and I felt really comfortable in my body for the first time in years. Yeah, it served you. So I did that. Yeah, I had an amazing woman on and then um, what happens is when she got abused as a kid, she just decided to put on so much weight because then she wouldn't be a target. Nobody would want to touch her. And that's sad. That upset me because I thought, fuck me, like, the pain that you go through, the, the, it's a life sentence. These people get it's a life sentence you've had. No matter you've got the conviction, yes, it might feel good. But up here, still there, no matter yeah. how much you work on yourself. And that's what people need to understand. And phew, it's just that the shit people have to go through and deal with, you don't really understand until you actually have a conversation and ask them. Because you tend to see a lot of people kind of open and honest when you actually break it all down. And I believe that's why these podcasts are so great. It's to give people an understanding, strength. And it's important other people we're watching going, you know what, if she can do it, I can do it. So see when you go through it all, he gets convicted. You came back to the UK. You've wrote your book. That, what gave you that inspiration to kind of really go inward and become very spiritual and very aware and in tune and understanding your traumas and pains? Like what was the, the moments? I um, actually worked for uh, I, I kind of I was going through a lot of crap with my husband and I started uh, listening to motivational speakers when I was going on my daily walks and I realised that um, we're the only ones that can change. We're the only ones that are responsible for ourselves and to change you sometimes have to make yourself uncomfortable. Uh, so I made myself uncomfortable putting dresses on, uh, but it came out, everything was really good for doing that. But I, I realized what was missing in my life was spirituality. Uh, and I, so I kind of started, I said to my husband, I was getting my God back on, uh, and I'm not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. I'm not into any religion or anything like that, but I started, um, really understanding that we're all spiritually connected, that we're all spiritual beings inside physical form. Uh, and I started doing studying about who I was and what made me tick in the greater whole of the world. And I think you, when you come through menopause as well, you go through a big journey as a woman in menopause. It changes you a lot. You, it changes your emotions. It changes your body when your eggs dry up. It's like going through puberty on steroids. Uh, and unless you actually have an understanding of what's happening with your body and communication skills with your family, and if you haven't dealt with stuff, from your past when you're a woman and you go through menopause and men go through menopause as well because at a certain age men's um, testosterone starts running out uh, and that can affect uh, their sex drive, affects their bodies, they get the middle aged dad bod, you know. So we, as humans we go through it uh, and at that stage in our lives if we haven't dealt with stuff that we haven't dealt with, it's going to come slap you in the face. Uh, 
and things needed to be dealt with. So me putting on a dress and becoming a beauty queen was me dealing with stuff. Me doing um, the court case with Rolf Harris surprisingly helped me deal with getting abused when I was 12 because in that courtroom I really felt like there was my 12-year-old girl. I was in there with a 15-year-old, a 14-year-old, a 7-year-old. We were all middle-aged women but it was all our little girls that were standing up against this man going, fuck you, mate. And we all got our little girl on uh, and I felt that and I felt that really strongly. And I think um, that was a big catalyst for me. Well, I know it was. It changed my life. Uh, and having a knowledge and becoming aware of who you are and really tapping into who you are on the inside uh, and changing the way how you talk about yourself and how you communicate to yourself about yourself and the words you use about yourself to yourself are really important. Like, you know, if I'm a loser or I'm fat or I'm this or I'm that, you'll stay being a loser, you'll stay being a fat. Uh, and I've, I've gone up and down in my weight my whole life, you know. I've, I've, I was fat, still got assaulted, can't change what my face looks like. My, um, you know, and I seem to put on weight and I still have an hourglass figure, it's just curvier, you know, and I've still got these legs. So it really didn't matter. So, you know, then losing weight and, and actually really loving my body and going, oh, well, I, I got to the stage where I thought, you know what, I'm 55, if anybody has a problem with my legs, because women used to get jealous. So when I was younger, my mum was jealous of my legs. So I started covering up at 19 and uh, I wouldn't wear makeup because I'm really fair so I take the eyelashes off and I'm really blonde um so I don't you know I don't look as pretty that's what I thought and I'd cover my legs up so I would have I had a better relationship with my mother because she wasn't so jealous of me other women would be going oh my god your legs and back in the like 70s and 80s they would literally say oh my god you bitch I hate you look at your legs and that would really hurt me uh, because it wasn't my fault what I looked like, but I felt because I was raised the way I was raised, I felt it was my fault what I looked like, that I made people feel bad in my presence. Um, and I went through life a lot, a lot of years like that. So it, whenever that would happen, next time they saw me, uh, you couldn't see my legs. Uh, so I covered myself up, not just for men, but for women. And then I got to 55 and thought, fuck you all. I'm uh, 55. <laughs> I look fucking hot. I have great legs. I have an excellent body and I'm fucking pretty. So, you know, I've aged really well. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm just gonna own who I am now. And and when you get to 61, like now, there's not much competition of looking really good. When you're young, everybody's beautiful. When you get older, it's like, okay, well, you really haven't looked after yourself. And I've looked after myself, you know. And I've looked after my mind, my body, my spirit, and my soul. And I think you, you, you beauty comes from the inside, and who you are shines out from the inside. And your joy, and your gratitude, and your you know your 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 life force shines out from your soul and comes out through your eyes. Um, and that's how we kind of age well and that's how we, we go through life, being happy and joyful, but we've dealt with our stuff. Yeah. So, you know, and now we have counsellors and coaches and if people haven't dealt with stuff, they need to talk to someone, a trusted someone, um, and that's the beginning of their healing journey and they have to realise that they are good enough, that we're all good enough, uh, that they are perfect just the way they are. When did you realise your mum was a narcissist? Um, I Googled narcissism. When I was little, I thought she had a, a split personality. Bipolar? Yeah. Uh, no, actually a split personality. Um, my dad, my brother and I called her Doris behind her back for Doris Day. She would be, she, Doris was fun. She would dance and sing and carry on um, and she was really fun to be around. She would be like that on the phone and then when she put the phone down, she would stop and she would switch. Um, I was only ever allowed to really talk to her in the commercial breaks of television uh, and I learnt when I became a speaker I learnt that I used to talk really fast because I was programmed that I only had a certain amount of time in the commercial break to talk and to talk about my day because as soon as her program came back on she completely ignored me and she was only really half paying attention to me anyway, you know. Uh, so I learnt... I learnt and was raised to believe that I, I wasn't important in my family and I wasn't important to my mother. I won state business awards and I'd ring at, you know, I remember ringing at 9 o'clock at night and my mother was like, well, are my program's on now. I'm like, well, can I talk to my father? Like I've just beaten out massive companies, like 40 companies around the state. We well, better hurry up. Like I'd done something really huge. Uh, so it, I realised and I learned at a very young age and all through young adulthood that it didn't matter what I achieved for my parents or my mother especially, it wasn't good enough. And it was pretty much I think my late 40s that I Googled this thing called Google. We love Google. We find out a lot about life. Um, daughters of narcissistic mothers. 
And I looked it up and I ticked all the fucking boxes of who she was. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. And I'd realised way before that that there was no such thing as a split personality really, that people were bipolar. Um, But from the age of 21... I was on a journey after my 21st birthday party with that my parents put on for me, which was interesting, and I'd come back from England uh, and uh, the lady up the road who I'd never met, she, she invited me out for a cup of tea and she sat me down and she said to me, I have to tell you something. She said, there's something seriously wrong with your mother and your father. She said, it's not you. There is nothing wrong with you, but there's something seriously wrong with your parents. And from that moment on, I was on a journey to figure out who I was and who I was without them, you know, with and I it took me seven years to unindoctrinate myself from the religious crap that had been put in my head uh, to find that who I was was good enough to realise that I was um, love-starved and needy because I was love-starved and needy, uh, you know, to find myself. Uh, I had some amazing friends who are still friends now who would sit there and let me talk and talk and talk and talk, which is why I know that speaking is about healing uh, and try and figure out who I was and and try and make sense of how uh, her behaviour towards me and his behaviour because it was never logical and I'm a pretty logical person. Uh, so having really good friends around me was key. If I didn't have them, uh, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. Uh, and I'm really grateful for that. They helped me, but it did. It took me ages to unprogram myself. Well, I call it my seven year period. Uh, Do you believe it comes in sevens? Yeah. Definitely say equals good seven, bad seven, good seven, bad seven. I don't so, know whether it's good seven, bad seven, but it was definitely seven years for me. Yeah, it's like a yin and yang, and it's it like, is. They say love only lasts seven years. Yeah. Some people say, I believe it can last for an eternity. Oh, I think it can last longer than that if you're with the right person. Yeah, love is ugh, as cheesy and cringy as it is. It's the most important thing. But we're so caught up in a race and to survive and to provide. It's, it takes us away from our true essence. It takes us away from our true being and, and it's to try and... Because purpose is the most important thing as well in life. It's to find something to enjoy your day and kick on and, and, and love. But it's so difficult because... I always say it, but everybody's confused. Nobody really knows what the fuck's going on. We can sit here and rhyme off all the motivational <laughs> quotes and spirituality in life, and we're doing okay. We've still got the smile on our face, and yeah. I'm proud of you for everything you're doing, but it's just difficult because you see a lot of misery and pain in people. I come across people I know instantly. You're not in a good place. I've, I've always done it. I've always had that presence where I, I you know can people. See people. Yeah, I feel people. And, I, yeah. and I, if I see, I've seen somebody crying actually last week and sat beside them says, everything okay? And I had the talk and... Yes, 45 minutes and hopefully it changed their day. They actually messaged me a couple of days ago just to say thanks. I needed that. But I don't know if I would, 10 years ago, if I would have sat down with them or asked them for their okay, they'd have fuck that creepy bastard and probably just walked past the poor cunt. But yeah, it's just that we, you don't know. But you're in a different, you're different now. You're yeah. older now. You've held a lot, you've, you've got more life experience. You've got more life knowledge. The older we get, the more experience we have, the more that we've seen, the more that we've, um, you've heard, the more people you've spoken to, the more we've heard of life. And it gives us more, um, knowledge about what makes us happy. And we see more sad people and we know what can be done sometimes to help them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you're just talking to someone is going to lift their day. And we don't know, we, we, look, we understand about having friends around us that are energy vampires. We have, we understand about having people around us who pull us down all the time. And you accept that sort of behavior because they're people that you love. I removed my mother from my life 10 years ago, went completely non-contact and also with my brother. So I don't have any family around me. So, you know, uh, I completely moved through life, uh, in, uh, apart from my child, you know, um, in a very, uh, a way that was about my protection because I realised that having narcissists around you are just not good for your mental health and I would not have been, I would not have become the beauty queen if I had my mother around me because of her jealousy thing, you know. So I think we have to sometimes, we have to make the hard decisions and we have to be brave and we actually have to walk away from people who are pulling us down. And they say that you surround yourselves, if you surround yourself with people who are successful uh, and happy, then you'll become successful and happy. Uh, Sometimes we have friends around us that are just pulling us down and we often have 
uh, parents and uh, family around us who may not be high achievers and you might be the only high achiever in the family um, and you don't achieve highly because it makes them feel bad about themselves, like me covering myself up because I felt that other people felt bad about, you know, what I, I looked like. But it was their problem, not mine. Mm -hmm. oh, and it took me years to figure that one out. So, well, you're the one with the issue. Mm -hmm. I'm not the one with the issue. You've got a problem about your body and you're actually transferring that onto me and that's what people do. Uh, and so we need to be aware that we have to be true to ourselves and, like I said, make the hard decisions mm -hmm. and walk away sometimes from people who are holding us back yeah. so we can achieve our full potential. So through your whole life of being abused and narcissistic mum and going through all the court cases, worldwide news, to covering up to not just protect yourself like a comfort blanket but you're trying to make everybody else feel at ease and low self-esteem, low confidence and then you're right, the 60s and you're 40, you won beauty pageants, you're doing the right thing. Like, how was it writing your book? It was great. I mm -hmm. loved writing my book. Uh, I, I my One of my um, motivations was uh, I work with, as a film and television hair and makeup artist, I work with women on set who are half my age and often half my fitness. And I remember uh, telling them only recently, you know, they're like, how old are you? I'm like, oh, I'm, like I'm 61 and they're just like, blown away it's like my mother doesn't look like you and she's not as old as you I want to be you when I grow up I want to I want to have your kind of vibe when I grow up and I want to look like you and I want to be fit and healthy and I realized that I lived my life a certain way with a certain mindset and a certain way of communication and uh, people need to have an upgrade they need to communicate better they need to realize that when they're talking they're talking maybe as they did when they were in their 20s and when they're in their 50s and 60s they've got to be changing it and growing up more uh, and I know that a lot about mindset and I live my life thinking positive things so there's a lot in my book about um, like interrupters people who interrupt there's a lot of people that interrupt. Uh, so there's things that I talk about, about the way we communicate and the mindset that we have that I thought were as important to talk to people about. Apart from diet things like don't eat batter and give up sugar and stuff like that because it hurts your joints uh, and to be mindful and to exercise and move it or lose it. And if you don't move your body when you're older, you will lose it. You will lose the fitness that you once had. But it's about, um, it's all about your mind. It's about the words that you use to describe yourself. And I felt that I had a lot of knowledge that I could impart to people because I wanted to make it easier. I feel that at this age it's if I can teach women and men from the age of 40 up and 45 up um, and give them the skills that they need so that when they get to 60 they look just as good at, at uh, like they're 40 because they have a better mental capacity of knowing who they are and and to kind of go about things from kindness and love for themselves and for others. So it's not a miserable, dreary old world that we live in, but we've got more uh, positive, vibrating people around, then the world's going to be a better place if we're surrounded by people who are vibrating in a place, a high place of joy and love rather than I'm depressed and I'm negative. If we're all really negative, it rubs off. Mm -hmm. uh, if we don't focus on the negative, we focus on positive, we are going to vibrate higher. And that's going to make us feel better. And if you feel happy and you feel gratitude, then you feel good. And then people see it and you smile at people in the street and they're going to feel good. So it just Definitely. rubs off on everyone. Where can people buy your book? I'm on Amazon. I'll leave the link in the description. What about going forward to the future, Susie? What's the plans? Um, well, I'm staying in England now. I decided to, I came here for three weeks and I decided to stay for six months because I feel that um, I'm really needed here to help people heal. I'm actually, I want to do, uh, I'm getting into corporate work and uh, uh, there's a big thing about sexual assault in business, in corporate at the moment. Uh, I'm going to use my fame uh, from being the voice of many uh, and helping other people to speak to businesses and help them and try and allay some of the communication problems. Again, it's about communication and boundaries that men and women have in the workplace so that we can have a better, happier place to be. Um, hopefully I'm going to be working with my cousin who I spoke with on the weekend who is um, uh, has a, an HR background. So together we're going to be, um, we're going to be coming for you, corporate. Mm -hmm. For How do you feel about speaking about today? Does it bring back a lot of emotion? Or are you used to it now? Um, it depending, it depends on who I speak to and it depends on the questions they ask me. So I got a little bit emotional with you. Sometimes I get asked questions and I'm just like, I just, I've done so many interviews. I still feel like I'm 
I'm in the cupboard when I talk about it. I don't feel any fear and I don't feel any pain. Um, talking to you uh, brought up some stuff, but it's stuff that I'm proud to bring up to help others heal. If I wasn't in touch with who I am, um, you can never fully walk away from who you are. Uh, if you can talk about it without tears, uh, then you've done a lot of healing. And by talking about it, uh, it helps other people. I remember I saw... Um, uh, Ellen DeGeneres on a video thing once and she got groped on the boobs when she was 14 and I was completely blown away and I it was like it kind of um, I had solidarity watching her. It's like, wow, okay, so it actually is a real thing. What happened to me? It's actually real because sometimes we compare, we never, we should never compare how we were assault, uh, assaulted and sexually assaulted or even spoken to in a bad way. We never compare because how it affected us is totally different to how it affects someone else. What has happened to me in my lifetime might not have, somebody else might not have batted an eyelid, might not have affected them at all. Um, but we have to make sure that we don't compare because it's, uh, we all have our own personal journeys and we all need to support each other on those mm -hmm. journeys. Proud of you for everything you're doing, everything you've overcome and being the voice for the voiceless and trying to give people an understanding of life and what you went through and how to overcome it, which is the most important thing. You've clearly went through a lot of trauma in your life. For anybody that's watching, that's maybe going through a narcissist partner or parents, some that it's been abused, some that it's struggled with mental health, what advice would you have for them? Um, reach out and find a coach. Um, uh, I do coaching. Actually, I don't like to call it coaching. I do mentoring. So coach, a coach is someone that will that will lead you to find your own answers and a mentor is someone that's going to say, I'm going to tell you what you can do. So there's two differences. So as long as people know the difference between a coach and a mentor, that's a good thing. Uh, but talk to people. Have a chat. Uh, reach out to someone that can help you. Reach out to a mental health person. Don't suffer in silence. It's not going to do you any good. Um, know that it's not your fault, that you're perfect just the way you are and that you need to deal with the stuff that you've got happening in your past so that you can be the person that you're supposed to be right now and reach your full potential. What's life all about? Last question, but what's it all about, do you think? I feel as if I can what's ask you that question. What's life all about? I think life is all about um, connecting with other people and sharing our journeys with others and having the best journey that we can. Um, it was really cool that I'm, I was in Ireland and I decided I was going to stay and it was really cool to actually be free to make that decision. Uh, I think to come at a place that's not fear-based, to be able to go through life holding your head high, being confident with who you are and making decisions and taking a risk. You have to take risks with life. Uh, you know, and wish and dream big, you know, have the big dreams because life has stuff in store for you. I just want to be on the other side of a camera and do commercials. I became an international beauty queen, you know. <laughs> life had a ton of stuff more in store for me uh, than I had ever even dreamed of, you know. Um, so dream, dream big, use your imagination, put it out there, use your mindset. You can manifest things in life. Um, but have faith in yourself and have faith in other people and smile and be grateful. So is an absolute legend, man. I wish you nothing but fucking positive and love and happiness for the future. You're a great person. You've overcome so much and for that I'm proud of you and I wish you nothing but the best. Thank God you, bless. James. Thank you.